Okay, fantastic. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We are here to talk about careers at national labs in the United States, what they are, what you do, what can you expect out of out of a job there. And, and honestly, this is a topic that I don't know much about either. So my questions are your questions and I'm excited to have this conversation with all of you. My name is Jessica Noviello and the Nexus NASA Postdoctoral Management Program Fellow at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So um, the usual spiel here is that uh, this program, this Professional Advancement Workshop Series is sponsored by the NASA Astrobiology Program. So thank you very much for these events. And uh, there is a code of conduct in place. I'm putting the, ooh, I thought I had copied the link already, but I will drop the link there in just a moment. And uh, we haven't had any any issues so far. I'd like to continue that tradition, and I'm sure you're all here to learn from each other. And I'm I'm very glad that that you are here because I know how much is going on. Um, so, without further ado, let us begin by introducing our speakers. We have with us today Corinne Scown, Roger Ains, and Josh Shidley, who are going to tell us all about their path from uh, from academia, that where we all get our, our PhDs, and uh, how they navigated into a national lab career. So, um, Corinne, would you like to kick us off? Sure. So thank you for having me. I probably do work that is pretty different from um, what most of you you folks do, but uh, hopefully, you know, a, a description of just kind of my general career path at the lab will be um, will be useful. So um, I uh, started school at Carnegie Mellon, did my uh, did my bachelor's degree there in civil and environmental engineering. Um, I ended up coming to UC Berkeley for grad school. And, uh, and I did a postdoc there as well. And then it was time to make some big career decisions. And up until, up until I decided to come to the lab, I was like fully expecting to go into academia. I wanted to be a professor. I did see some people like become sort of jaded <laughs> and decide not to stay in academia, you know, either in their PhD or maybe it took a while as like a postdoc before they decided to like jump shit. But I was like still on board. And so um, I had two years of faculty interviews, the first where um, I interviewed one place and didn't get any offers. And then the second where like the stars aligned and like, I, you know, everything was like amazing. I, I had all these options. And, um, you know, the, th the thing that I struggled with was, um, well, a lot of those universities were like land grant universities in places that I didn't really want to live because I wanted to be in a city. I like cities. Um, and, uh, and, and second, I was still trying to like feel out like what like sort of work life balance I wanted for myself. Like it was the first time I had this realization that like I wouldn't be like working towards some short term goal and then I would have like worked really, really hard and arrived and then it was like, you know, okay, now on to the next thing. It was like, all right, what do you want the rest of your life to look like? Um, and so I had kind of this like existential crisis where I was trying to, you know, figure out like, is this, is this really what I want? And, um, and a job opened up at, at Lawrence Berkeley lab. I decided to apply because I just thought, you know, I can't hurt to have, you know, one more offer. Like what's the harm? It's not that much work to apply. Um, and, you know, I, I interviewed and, and decided to uh, stay at the lab. And, and you know, I, I didn't really think that I would be there like long, long term. I thought, well, maybe I'll do this for a few years and then I'll decide to go do something else. Um, but I've liked it. So I started at the lab in 2012 as a principal scientific engineering associate, which like in hindsight was like kind of a ridiculously junior position <laughs> to be like choosing over an assistant professor position. Like literally like, University of Illinois, it was like, choose the kind of wood that you want for your office. And LBL, like I showed up on my first day and they were like, oh, we don't have a spot for you. We forgot to get like, and then they put me in a cubicle and I just like went home, like crying my first day. I was like, what did I do? <laughs> um, but I, as I, I think it's harder to get started at, at a lab, or at least it was for me, cause I didn't, it's soft money. They don't really do startup packages. And so it was kind of like, I was immediately broke 
I was like, oh God, I have to apply for grants like all day, every day and just like get some money so that I can pay myself and have a group. Um, so I did that. And since then the lab has instituted an, um, an early career uh, like internal seed program. And so it's kind of like a startup package. I'm so glad they've done that. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was tough getting started. I'd say my first year was like really, really difficult. And then I kind of got momentum and I raised enough money that like I could start to be a little choosy about what projects I did. I could pick and choose the people that I worked with. So I love that like I can pick my favorite people and be like, I'm collaborating with you. Like I get to like build my work community around the people who I think are smart and funny and nice and just like a delight to work with. Um, and uh and so it's just kind of continued uh, on that road. And I, I started moving into management. I became a deputy group leader and then a group leader and then um, a department head and I'm a deputy division director. Um, and that's been pretty rewarding as well. It's really nice to have a chance to, um, I would say the best part about that job is like sort of elevating some of the more like um, early career scientists, like finding ways to help them find grants, find collaborators, like build a career. Like when we see that payoff, it's just awesome. Um, so I'll stop there and um, talk more in the Q&A. That is so cool. I, I did not know your background. So that was very interesting to hear about it. And um, I'm so glad that you're happy. Um, I hope you are anyway. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's way better now. <laughs> awesome. All right, next up, we will hear from Dr. Roger Ames. Oh, just Roger, please. Um, na national Lab, one of the things about National Labs is it's a very flat environment. Um, you know, uh, I, I call my director, Kim, um, you know, there, there's not a lot of hierarchy in, at least, at least in my lab, and I think that's true of others. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, well, first of all, I, I'm the I'm the chief scientist of the energy program at Lawrence Livermore. So, and I've been there for 38 years. So that's older than I know all of you, but um, I've seen, you know, a lot of the history of the labs and I understand the differences among them. There are 17 national labs ranging from tiny aims, which would probably fit in my office. That's not fair there, but they're only a couple hundred people to Sandia that is the size of a small city. And um, and they all have different characters, but I, I think the, the main difference is you heard Corinne talk about an Office of Science Lab, which is gonna be very similar to your experience at NASA. You're, you're pursuing science in the national interest, but the scientists themselves compete for a lot of the money. Then there are the more applied labs, which, Josh can tell you about NREL, but the, the NNSA labs, you'll hear that phrase, which is Los Alamos, Livermore, and Sandia, um, are fundamentally applied science labs, mostly in national security. Um, you know, some of that's nuclear weapons, but a lot of it's all kinds of other things, including assessing what other people are doing, um, understanding our lab spends a lot of time on fusion, energy research that's the the biggest program that we have we have the national ignition facility that does fit plasma research but the important thing about most of those things is that they're not pi driven most of our programs are larger efforts where people come together you work as part of a team uh, after you've been here for a little while often a very short while you're responsible for helping to create the next set of projects but um at, at Livermore, you're never brought in and expected to generate your own funding. You're brought in to do a, a work on a specific task. My uh, efforts are all focused around carbon removal today. How do we remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? We have about 100 people that do that. And as we add people to that, they, they're always part of an existing project. But as the effort is expanding rapidly, they very quickly have an opportunity to do what Corinne said, which is to generate their own options and, and to uh, you know, be in charge of their own projects. But generally within an envelope, um, this, it's not like a university. You don't just pursue anything you want. Sometimes, I mean, you can sometimes do that, but in general at a national lab, you're, you're focused on some area of expertise. Like, you know, for my 
the people that I work with were focused on removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And if somebody comes to me and says, I want to work on the physics of the moon, I'm like, okay, well, you need to go find somebody who's interested in that because that's not what we do. I'll turn it over now. All right. There are actually a couple of questions about uh, that touch on a lot of the things you just said. So we uh, we would, will definitely come back to some of these ideas. Thank you. Um, okay. And last but certainly not least is Josh Shidley. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, excited to be here. Uh, Corinne and Roger laid out a lot of the landscape of the National Labs in part already. So I'll give a little bit maybe more background about myself. Uh, so I'm chemical engineering by training. I've uh, done a lot of work in the catalysis space in grad school. And I started up at NREL straight out of grad school as a postdoc and didn't know anybody at NREL, applied just for an open position and came in as a postdoc and have been navigating the, the ecosystem of the National Labs and at NREL for the last 10 years, almost 11 years now, um, and have stepped through various roles of you know moving in just starting as a postdoc with an emphasis on publishing papers and doing more fundamental science to transition into individual project leadership uh, eventually stepping into more like platform leadership roles and consortium leadership roles uh, and now I, I lead up our similar to what Roger was talking about carbon dioxide removal I lead our carbon management program uh, at NREL uh, I also uh, serve as our within NREL we have a couple different science and technology directorates that focus on different topics. So one is energy systems integration. Another one is materials and, and chemistry. Uh, the directorate that I sit in is our bioenergy science and technology directorate. Uh, and a few years ago, we as a lab decided to establish a chief of staff position for each one of those science and technology directorates. And each directorate uses it a little bit differently, uh, that role, but I, I serve as our chief of staff for our, our bioenergy science and technology directorate, which has about 300 individuals in it. Uh, and that emphasis that I take is not on really staff side, it's actually on strategy and where we're going as a directorate, where we're going as a lab. Um, so it's kind of fun to see multiple sides of this, get to work on projects and research and at the same time, think about long-term strategy at the lab. So happy to, talk on those lines as well as we go. Well, thank you all again for being here today and, and for introducing yourselves. Um, are we ready to jump into questions? Do it. Yeah. All right. So I put up to um, Slido. I, I'm, I'm still playing around with it, but, but Slido is how we're organizing our, our questions. But there's also a word cloud that I asked participants to fill out. And the question is, what do you know about National Labs already? And a lot of the responses are very vague that um, one of the top is is very little. And another uh, response is people do research there. And it, it's true, but um, definitely uh, there are a lot of questions and there's just a lot that we don't know about these National Labs. So maybe we'll start out with just how do you even come to work at a national lab? What are the pathways in? And if you could speak to the pathways uh, for PhDs versus master's degree holders, uh, that would be great because there is a question about that specifically. You know, let me answer that one because I can say at Livermore, I'm very pleased to say that our lab has twice had directors who had master's degrees. And why is that? It's because what we do at a national lab is rarely done somewhere else. It's science, it's applied science, but you have to come here, you have to learn about what's going on. And you, you, you know, a lot of people with master's degrees come here and, and have the equivalent of a PhD pretty quickly, but on the job. So that happens all the time. It, it, there, we have about uh, an equal number of PhDs and master's degree people here. And there's no question that the PhDs have a, a wider set of authority, but uh, there, there's, it's in fact frowned upon to mention what someone's degree is here. You would never call someone doctor. That just isn't done. Um, and part of that is, is to not discriminate against the people who don't have a PhD. 
Yeah, it totally varies lab to lab. So LBL is like probably much closer to an academic environment than it is to a lot of other national labs. And so having a PhD is fairly essential. The vast majority of folks in career science, like scientist roles, including our management, have PhDs. And um, uh, yeah, it's kind of the ex exception that somebody rises up through leadership. Uh, sorry, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. LBL is Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Um, uh, it's kind of the exception rather than the rule that somebody sort of rises up in, in the sort of scientific ranks. Um, and we all and all of our managers are scientists um, uh, without having a PhD. Yeah, I can I can add on a bit. Um, yeah, from the, I would say the, the predominant route into the lab most of the time is, is through a postdoc. At least that's what I see. I mean, we definitely hire folks that are, you know, mid-career engineers, mid-career scientists at various times. A lot of times those are strategic hires. We're trying to bring in some new capability or expertise. But I think the bulk of folks that are at the labs many times come in, at least at NREL, come in through a postdoc route, end up, uh, at, if they're lucky enough to do well enough, funding aligns, they get hired on as staff. Um, and then have a chance to kind of develop and, and grow from there. So I think that's the highest, at least probably the predominant route in. Uh, in terms of, you know, a PhD versus the master's, uh, I think there's probably two perspectives I would add. One is, I think generally the progression can be the same at NREL in many senses, but often a, coming in with a PhD helps you move up that ladder faster, where they're often requiring many more years if you're a master's only to have many more years of experience before you could make that same jump that somebody who comes in with a PhD does. The other point I'll make about this is we are one of the applied labs along with Idaho National Lab and National Energy Technology Lab. And what that means is we do a lot more work that's scale up focused, build reactors and integrate them together. You know, for those of us, many of us who've gone through, you know, PhDs in, in grad school, you're often not an expert in actually building a system, designing a system, integrating a system. You know, you need expertise on the mechanical engineering side, the technician side of being able to weld and bring these units together. And so many of our folks that uh, handle many of our larger projects and build systems don't come from a PhD background. They come from masters or technical backgrounds, um, but they still play major roles in these larger integrated scale up projects that we have at the lab. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that um, we are desperate for good postdocs right now. So I saw there was a question <laughs> in the Slido about like, how do you get a postdoc there? Like, just look at the job postings. I mean, every PI is like, please yeah. apply to my jobs. <laughs> so that should not be hard. <laughs> and and like any job, um, you know, the trick is to get up, follow people that you're interested in, get on the web, look at the work that's available, and I would say that at least half of the people, probably more, I, I've hired about 50 people in the last three years to work in carbon management work. And uh, they just send in resumes. You know, the, the really interesting hires are the ones who send in resumes and say, I'm doing something that's related to what you're doing. And I think, you know, I would be interested in working with you. And of course, you know, getting a job application into a, a posted job is fine too, but that whole, th you know, writing a letter to somebody and sending your resume in is a great way to get a job at a national lab, whereas, you know, you couldn't do that at a university, but it works all the time here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, that, that's a great, and, you know, maybe the person isn't hiring, like, right that moment, so contacting them early before you, like, need a job, like, tomorrow <laughs> is good like get, get on that person's radar and you know it really helps to have like you know their work like you're reaching out for a specific reason i get a ton of emails probably like one a day where it's like dear sir or madam here is my cv i would like to work in your esteemed lab and i just, just like archive them because most of the time it's not, nothing to do with what i work on but if you see somebody you really want to work with like reach out and we do have, uh, at least most of the labs that I'm aware of, have like a fellowship program as well. So in addition to applying to like a specific job posting for a specific project where somebody needs a postdoc, there's also routes through fellowships. 
where you kind of have more of an opportunity to define the own, your own scope of work and you get some funding allocated to you to do that work and you're, you, know, you work with a mentor at the national lab um, who supports you, but you kind of have a little bit more freedom. Those are highly competitive, uh, but definitely another route where you have a little bit more flexibility in what you pursue. And many of you have been working in discovery science at NASA, and that's part of what happens at National Labs. Um, Corinne's lab does more of that than either Josh or I, and the physics labs like Brookhaven do a lot of that. But the more of the jobs are in the applied science side of here's a problem that the nation needs to solve. For instance, you know, all of us, the three of us are all engaged in, in dealing with climate technology and carbon management and you know, solving that problem. And so sure, there's some discovery science there, but there's a whole hell of a lot of what do we do about it? How do we build things and how do we build teams? And that's the big difference at national labs between as opposed to universities is that you intrinsically work in teams um, you know, at my lab, there are 8,500 people here, and I can approach any one of those people and say, can you help me with this problem? And they'll say yes. Um, it's just a very collegial, team-oriented thing. And, you know, our, our, any project we have tends to be, you know, probably the size of university teams, but, um, but they can be very large. Like, um, you know, they can have hundreds of people working together for one large goal. And that's uh, frankly, one of the things that's really fun about working in a national lab is the ability to suddenly have all that expertise available and you don't have to go figure it out on your own. You can, you know, I can't tell you how many times a, a statistics problem has come up or a heat transfer problem has come up and I'm like, okay, I'll just go to the world expert and they'll help me with it. Oh yeah, wow. To have a, it, it I mean, 50% of my day at least is, is tracking down the person who knows the answer to the question that I have. So knowing that there would be people around me at a national lab to help with that, wow, cuts down on so much time. Um, we do have a couple of questions regarding um, international student and international uh, people participation. So there's one question that says, as an international student carrying out a PhD in the US, what are the chances to be a part of a national lab as a postdoc and to have a career there? Um, I think it, it depends on the lab, like how, how they handle that. I mean, LVL, it, it, I would say like generally we have tons of international postdocs. Um, I don't know if it's the majority, but it's, it's a lot. So, you know, I would certainly encourage um, applying. There are um, uh, guidelines for, there are specific countries that require sort of additional review <laughs> before someone gets hired. Um, we don't, in the application process, like we, we do not and cannot discriminate on the basis of um, citizenship status. Um, but it, it, that review can slow the hiring process down depending on um, where that, that person is a citizen. Um, so that's, that's the only caveat I would, I would mention. But um, yeah. We have well. some jobs. In fact, we have quite a few jobs that require you to be a citizen because you have to have a security clearance. But that's by no means all of our jobs. And I have quite a few um, foreign nationals working for me, including Chinese nationals. Um, I, I would say that the national security labs, Los Alamos, Livermore, and Sandia are less um, likely to hire um, international students, but that, that there's still lots of them. So it, it's not, it's not a, by no means an impediment. Yeah, I think they've captured that well. We hire quite a few international folks as well. I honestly was not sure what the answer was going to be. So that's really, um, that's really cool. Uh, we have another question here on how does the work life balance compare to that of academia? And I'm sure um, you will all have much to say on this topic because it's, it's an important one. Who, I'm curious about the person who asked that question. What's their perspective on the work-life balance in academia? Uh, that was me. I'm a master's student. Okay, tell, tell us more. 
tell me more. Okay, tell us more. So I want to hear what you think, and then I, that helps us discuss. Yeah. I think. Um, so I'm a master's student at Penn State. I also did my undergrad here um, okay. at Penn State, and my work-life balance in undergrad was quite poor. The astronomy department here has quite a reputation for being unnecessarily gatekeepy. Um, so I was working pretty excessively in undergrad, but now that I'm a master's student um, in the geosci department, um, I found that my work-life balance is a lot better, but I still see that like once you get up the rungs to like the level of like a tenure track professor, it goes back to being quite bad again. Um, I want weekends off. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks for sharing. I appreciate yeah. that, yeah. I can take a crack at this because I kind of straddle both worlds. I have a joint appointment at UC Berkeley and then my appointment at LBL. Um, people will give you really cagey answers. I went around during my faculty interviews and asked everybody this, what hours do you keep? Like walk me through your day. Like how long are you in the office? And everybody would give these bizarre answers for like, I don't know, what does this mean? Um, it, like different people like to operate in different work hours. I will tell you what works for me at a national lab. I have two kids, they're little, the age three and six. I have to set boundaries. I start work at 9 a.m. because I'm like driving around, dropping everybody off. And I have to be done with my meetings at 5 p.m. because I have to go pick everybody up. Um, and then I will say like, as time has gone on, as I've moved into management and voluntarily applied for a ton of grants and probably taken on more work than I should, I have ended up having to open my laptop again and work for like one to two hours in the evening after the kids go to bed. But I don't work on the weekends. I, like I'll answer the occasional email, but I am not sitting down or going to the office and like spending all day Saturday or all day Sunday working. So that's my like very honest, like this is how much I work answer. Um, I think there's also differences in culture between academia and national labs. So my observation is that like when I work with academics, they tend to much more often expect that people are like around and are willing to get stuff done on Saturday and Sunday. So they'll email you something on like Friday evening and be like, can you get this to me like Sunday morning? And you're like, uh, and it's, you know, it's just a matter of planning ahead, right? Like you don't, <laughs> you could get it all done in the week, but like not if somebody emails it to you Friday night. Um, and I think part of that is just that like students are kind of on this more fluid schedule. And so it just creates an atmosphere in academia where like there is no like clear boundary like that. The national labs are a little, the culture is such that you can get away with not working on the weekend for the most part, which is part of what I like about it. And, and I think that that sort of, there's a strong family feeling at our lab of we're, you know, I've been there for 38 years. I've worked with the same people all that time. They're my friends, they're my colleagues. We take care of each other. And part of taking care of each other is not asking you to do ridiculous things until you need to. I mean, there are times in, in the national interest where, um, you just do stuff where you're disappeared for six months. And when you come home, your kids are proud of you and they're glad you did it. <laughs> um, but most of the time it, it's, it's much, it's not go, go, go for the sake of getting more clicks, you know, for, for collecting journal references. It's, it's, you know, you do it when it's needed. And, um, you know, in, in general, I, I, I have a lot of friends in academia. And I don't envy them. Um, I have a lot more flexibility and, you know, I feel like, you know, our vacation is real. Um, and, um, and I think it's a lot easier for people with families to maintain a, a reasonable work-life balance because you don't have the pressure, especially the pressure of tenure. Um, that doesn't exist. Um, you know, yes, if you're a postdoc, you, you have some concern of, of getting hired on, but uh, we hire half of our postdocs, 25, the other 25% of our postdocs go and take other jobs. They don't want to stay. And they're, you know, so it's actually a pretty high rate of capture. It's not a, you know, not the kind of pressures that you have for tenure. Yeah, I would just, I would just say the flexibility piece. I think that Roger mentioned and, and Corinne mentioned in part, like it's, it's flexibility and your need to set boundaries for what works for you. And everybody does that differently. And I think there's been, even before the pandemic and everything else, that flexibility was there, right? To sort of work around what works best for you. And, and I'm in a similar boat with Corinne where I have three little ones. And so my 
you know, every day is different. Every day has a random call with a bump on the head in the middle of the day and you're out for half the afternoon. So you got to go pick up a kid. Like I, I work, you know, very strange hours based on what works best for me and my family and, and when I need to be at meetings and things. Um, and so I do, you know, I'm, I, I would say different from Corinne, I do work on the weekend sometimes because I choose to take off, you know, during the week to go mountain biking or do whatever, you know, in, in different times that I want. And I pick that up on the weekends and that's what allows me to stay focused the most. And so I think the flexibility is, is there. Um, you know, I don't want to suggest that there are plenty of people who work long hours at the national labs. I don't want to suggest that's not true. There are plenty of folks who hustle and bust it. And some, many of them do that kind of like Corinne said by choice and they get themselves in when they write tons of proposals and they feel like they got to just keep going and going and going and they do that. And then they've got to execute on that work. Uh, and so you can get in those situations. I mean, I think on average people, I would guess at least probably work 45, 50 hours, um, you know, at the lab as a guest is a sort of lower end. Um, and then I think people who really want to go wild and choose to live that lifestyle go much beyond that. One of the things that I think is, is nice about the labs is there's, um, a job, there's a whole range of different approaches you could take, you know? At Livermore, there's a whole lot of people who do really interesting science, but never write a proposal. Um, and in fact, most of them never write a, write a paper, but they're doing really interesting science that they love. And it's the kind of thing that you all are enjoying doing today. And that's a great job. And, you know, that's that they enjoy that life. And then there's people like me who look at the lab as a giant toolbox that I can use to drive things that I'm interested in. I, you know, I, I can turn it into stuff that I want to make happen. And, and I've had three different jobs while I've been at Livermore and I created all of them myself um, and, you know, and was able to actuate them. And so for me, I have a lot more responsibility and, you know, I have to think about how these things are, are playing out. I can't just come in at nine o'clock and leave at five, but the fact that it's a choice and the fact that at different points in your career, like when you have young kids, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing that right now. Um, uh, is one of the really, I think, great um, advantages of working at a national lab, recognizing that every one of the labs is a little different. Every lab has a little different culture. And, um, you know, Sandia is, is more rigid than Los Alamos, which is, um, and both of them are a lot more rigid than Livermore. We're the, the long hairs, the people who are, you know, supposed to go out and do radical things. Um, but all of them are much more flexible than industry. Somebody asked about that. Um, you know, we, we tend to have projects that we work on, but there's always the opportunity to generate your own pathway. There's always the opportunity to have your own input in how, how the path is going forward. And, um, you know, much more flexibility than you'll have in industry, in my experience. Okay, I'm between two questions that I'd like to ask next, but um, I think this one will be pretty quick, so I'll do this one first. Um, how easy or difficult would it be for someone who's more from the natural side of science? Um, I know you all have chemistry, chemical engineering backgrounds. So um, somebody from maybe physics or geology, I'm not entirely sure what um, what what the, the asker intended, but it just says the natural side of earth science into uh, climate technology. There are so many things that are important in climate today and so many good jobs. My son got a PhD in archaeology and is now central to climate work at Cambridge University. Um, it, climate is everything. <laughs> and the other really cool thing about climate work is there are no experts today. Um, there's no professional society. There's no standards board. Um, it's being created all the time. You can pick up, read articles, pay attention. Two years, you can be an expert. Five years, you can be a world expert. Um, because it doesn't exist yet and it's growing rapidly. So, um, you know, particularly on the earth science side um, in our lab, we have a big soil science effort to understand how soils participate in climate work. Um, very much biology 
oriented, very much genomics and and you know the relationship between geology and 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 uh, genomics. So uh, I'd say the labs are um, heavily physics and and engineering oriented. Our lab has two thousand engineers, um, but that doesn't mean there aren't enormous interesting jobs for you know, biologists, et cetera. I know many of you are in astrobiology, so that's gonna be of interest. Um, Corinne or Josh, anything to add? I think Roger covered it. Yeah. All right. All right, I'm gonna combine two questions next. Uh, the one question is where, why are they called national labs, which kind of ties into where does the funding come from? at a national lab? Uh, well, I, they're all in some way or another sort of federally created, federally sponsored. You can apply for grants from other agencies. Like we get a lot of grant money from the California Energy Commission. So you can apply for a lot of the same grants that, um, that academics apply for, um, or you know, in some cases industry. Um, but then there are uh, labs that are sort of like, quote unquote, owned by different parts of the federal government. So like LBL is a Department of Energy Office of Science Laboratory. A lot of the funding comes from the Office of Science, but not all of it. The Office of Science doesn't like bankroll all of us and say like, okay, go do fun science. Like I still have to apply for grants. And a lot of my money comes from uh, sources that are not the Office of Science, um, you know, the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy um, uh, side of DOE, the more applied side, um, you know, state agencies, et cetera. Um, and, and maybe uh, Roger and Josh can sort of add on how it works at the other labs. Yeah, we're, we would be at NREL would be kind of the analogous to what Corinne is at Berkeley Lab, but for EERE. So we are a EERE sponsored lab. We are focused more on the applied side. And so I would say the bulk of our funding in the same way comes through the EERE. Sorry, um, what, what is EERE? En Ener energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office. So it's an office that sits underneath Department of Energy heading. It's an office underneath us. Um, and so it's, it's one of their, you know, so that's who we are primarily connected to as NREL and where we primarily get I would say the bulk of our funding. Uh, some of that is, I won't call guaranteed money, but some of that is largely set up to be directed towards the labs and we still have to compete for that, but some amount of funding is set up to be directed towards the labs. And then there's a chunk of funding that's set up to be competitive, wide open with universities and industry. And we often can partner on some of those proposals. Um, but so some pieces of our funding is largely competitive under EERE and some pieces is a little bit more directed towards the national labs. Uh, and then on top of that, we do, as, as Corinne said, we bring in funding from uh, from other entities. So that can even be like, you know, working directly with specific companies and corporations that so we bring in. I think NREL is about 80 to 85 percent DOE funding and the other 15 to 20 percent is uh other outside of DOE with a large portion of that being industry direct funded i think it's very similar to the nasa labs in that there is a a, a national mission there's a budget that comes from congress that is distributed amongst the nasa labs same for the doe labs and then you know at our labs we have we have to get in and argue for why we should get our share of it or why we've developed an expertise that's most applicable to that and the the bigger the chunks are the more that's already been determined um you know our, our national ignition facility our fusion energy facility the budget for that is set by congress um so that's and then there's you know little things around the edge that you can compete on but that one's a big chunk that's determined already um, and hiring and et cetera, already set by that um, chunk of money. And then you get to my world, which is entirely um, competitive, mostly from government agencies, some philanthropy. And, um, you know, it, it looks a lot like academia in, in my world, but I'm a small fraction you know, I have 100 people working with me of the 8,500 people at Livermore. Um, most of the jobs at, at 
um, Livermore, Sandia, and Los Alamos are part of one of these giant programs that are, you know, fundamentally the budget and the scale are set by Congress, much like, you know, a, a, a NASA, you know, a, a moon program would be. The budget's been set by Congress. So that ties into another question that I see on this list, and I'm, I'm curious too, is there any flexibility for compliance, legal, administrative roles with congressional leadership for bioenergy, comma, DOE? Let me see. Uh, sort of opportunity, yeah, let me uh, double check that question. I was looking at it earlier, compliance, legal, administrative roles with congressional leadership. Well. Okay, um, so what I would say about that is um, if you are a, a scientist in a national lab, and I, I assume this is limited to sort of like career scientists, like a, maybe not if you're a postdoc, but you can do a detail at DOE. Um, you know, you typically wouldn't be working on like compliance stuff. You would be more working on like the, pro like administering projects and guiding the scientific direction. Um, but there are opportunities to um, kind of take time off from your regular LBL job and go work on the DOE side. Um, but yeah, things like legal and administrative roles I, I, with congressional leadership, I think those would tend to be like entirely separate jobs. And so if you wanted to do that, um, there's some flexibility in the kinds of details you can do, but that may just be a job that you would need to like apply for rather than going to a national lab. But I would point out that right now in a lot of government agencies, including DOE and the Department of Agriculture, which many of you may be interested in, um, there are fellowship positions in headquarters offices to think about these major problems that we're facing and, and look at how policy should be implemented and how do we get to spend all that money that Congress has allocated for this. And those fellowship positions are really very much like a postdoc, but with a little more responsibility. They're, they're sort of halfway in between a postdoc and a career job, but they're typically for a year or two. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in, in a career in climate to think about those because then you find out how government really works and then you you can decide you know how you want to implement that but i know that to uh, you know somebody with your backgrounds right now government is a completely opaque thing and to actually find out how it works is a good idea like any piece of science you, you know you, when you know how your instrument works you can use it better well it's the same with government um josh did you want to to add anything I think it's well captured. I think the detail is probably the most uh, closely aligned answer to the to the question. I, I'll just maybe elaborate a touch on sort of the role of the national labs, because uh, I think this is probably a, a worthwhile reference point. You know, we are generally intended to be unbiased. You know, we're not supposed to go in and pick winners. We're not supposed to advocate or make or recommend policy. We're generally supposed to do unbiased analysis, provide that to policymakers. They make their own decisions, you know, put, put forth those policies. And so, you know, if, if you want to be much closer to the policy making side, that National Lab is probably not the best fit for you. There are elements of things we do that do inform policy, but, you know, we're not ad going to congressmen and advocating for them to institute some policy. That's not our role. And so I just figured I'd make that reference to that question as well. Not that they don't ask us, and we're and we <laughs> important there, but we have to wait to be asked. Yeah. Huh. You know, um, I, I want to address this thing, this question about how much you get paid, because it's a big deal. The pay at the national labs is competitive with local industrial jobs. It's a hell of a lot better than academia at all low levels. And you know, at some point you blow through into full professor and, and some, you know, if you're a full professor at Stanford, you know, you've got a yacht, but um, uh, the, you know, especially our postdoc positions, we try to be very competitive. We recognize that people have to live. They have families. <laughs> We're not paying anybody $45,000 a year to be a postdoc. Um, you know, that said, I think in industry, you have opportunities to make more money because you have things like bonuses that we don't have you don't 
you know, that doesn't happen. And, you, you know, your company never gets bought out. You never get a stock option um, payout. But, you know, the, the uh, it's competitive. And I think that's important if you're thinking about a family and thinking about balance of life, you know, is, is you know, am I going to actually make enough money to, to support a family? And um, in general, the answer is yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say like the way, if I moved to a, a primary academic position at UC Berkeley, I'd probably take a pay cut relative to where I am. Like years ago, maybe like five, six years ago, if I had moved from my position to industry, I would have doubled my salary. I think now higher up in management, if I moved from where I am to industry, I would quadruple my salary. <laughs> So, so like in industry, I think the salaries kind of balloon as you become more senior to the point where like we have people, you know, at division directors or associate lab directors who would go and they get offered like CTO positions at companies where they would make like massively more money than, than they do at the lab. But I think especially on the lower end, it tends to be pretty competitive. Like the postdoc salaries are, are much better at national labs than I think most universities. And at that junior level, it's yeah, potentially a two x difference um, with with industry, but better than academia, and you have a lot of flexibility. It's really fun work. Yep, I would agree. Okay, I'm convinced. This is a pretty awesome. Uh, national labs are pretty awesome places to work. Uh, good salary flexibility sounds great. Um, what kinds of skills should I or um, anybody want or seek to cultivate before they apply for a national lab position? And are there any skill sets that are particularly in demand? All of the labs tend to be focused on solving problems. So they're a little more applied than, you know, just discovering science. And so your ability to solve problems and your ability to work in a team are sorts of things that get you attention at labs. That said, I think there's a wide range of technical issues, you know, that are, that are addressed. And I, I think that always an ability to communicate well is important to anyone, any jobs you're going to apply for. But that uh, demonstrated ability to work in teams and to be an effective member of a team and frankly to be a rational person um i don't hire any assholes um and i'll tell you honestly if somebody if i see a resume if i pick up a resume from a, a, a phd or a postdoc that has 20 publications on it i put it down that's not the kind of person you know that's either they're working on problems that are trivial and churning out papers, or they're working 26 hours a day, and that and that isn't a good fit either. So, you know, I'm looking for reasonable people. I want, I, you know, as I say, I work with these people, you know, these are, these are my family, so I, I, I want to get along with them. Yeah, I mean, when I came to, to um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, the, the kind of pitch that I got as I was interviewing is like, you come here to do big science. And by big science, you really mean like team science. And so I think the no asshole rule is like even maybe much more important at a national lab, which I like. I like working with nice people. I'll say Roger is an excellent judge of character. Everybody he brings into collaborations ends up being like a gem. Uh, <laughs> and Thank so- um, I, you know, I like, I like that, that, that you get people, you, you know, people sort of get selected based on their ability and willingness to work well as part of a team more so than what you have to do in, in academia. I, I'm glad to hear that Roger still takes my calls in. So I guess I know where I fall on this, uh, <laughs> on his scale, but at least he still picks up the phone. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think what else I would add. I, I think maybe two things I would add is understanding the so what around what you're, why you're doing something and being able to focus your efforts on solving the so what and going after that, as opposed to just 
you know, opposed to just picking a direction and running it down, like actually understanding. And, then, and along those lines, I think the second piece of that is the adaptability side. You know, I, I would say I came into the lab with one expertise and where I'm at now is completely different in my current expertise. And I think that adaptability and willingness to pivot to focus on what's needed as opposed to applying a specific tool and a hammer just to everything that comes your path. Like I think being able to be adaptable is something we, we look at a lot because as Roger said, and, and Corinne said, we form teams. And sometimes your role in that team is gonna vary drastically uh, across the board. And so being able to be adaptable and not always just think one way and understand what the problem needs in order to be solved. And the problems that come to national labs are not problems that have existing big groups and universities teaching them to do them. They're all new problems. They're new things that you have to figure it out. And so you have to learn new stuff. And, and that's really fun. Um. <laughs> that ties into, I, I think we only have time for, for one or two more questions, but Roger, what you just said ties into an existing question of, of how do the science questions differ at national labs from the ones at universities or other research institutions. So besides like team science and um, really cutting edge stuff, are there, um, I don't know, what are the differences beyond that? Corinne's the closest to that. Um, yeah, the, the differences between academia and national at well, I think you can, frankly, I think I'd be doing this almost the same research that I am now if I were in academia. I might not be part of uh, the, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, which is like one of the more fun things that I do because it's this big, you know, team science kind of research institute where it's way more people sort of coordinating on these big ambitious projects than what I would do uh, as an academic. But other than that, I mean, I write papers at LBL because we're so closely connected with UC Berkeley. Um, I uh, advise PH, recruit and advise PhD students and sit on their committee. Uh, I teach classes when I want to, but I don't teach them when I don't want to. So it's a pretty sweet gig. Like it's you pick it, I get, get to take the parts back to you and I like and leave the parts that I, that I don't like. Um, but yeah, I don't think my research is that would be that different. It might be, I think things are different at some of the other labs. Um, yeah, you, you tend to get these, you know, things where there's a big national push to solve a problem, or in the case of an enormous amount of the, the chemistry and physics that's done as my lab is related to national defense questions. And, and um, you know, those aren't things that generally come up that much in academia, but uh, you know, we do, we have a lot of material science that is, is based upon the needs of things in exotic environments. Um, but, you know, it's really good material science, but uh, the, you know, the, well, but, you know, Corinne and I were working on something that we're, we're doing a report for uh, the Department of Energy to look at the options for carbon dioxide removal across the entire country that is, is, locally based county based information how would we what are the best options for in you know a, a certain county in tennessee or you know the southwest region or things like that and that's a team oh boy what do we got 25 people working on that corinne at uh, least it feels like more <laughs> yeah, uh, so 12 institutions yeah. um and and we are writing a report that will influence national policy uh at a bunch of levels and that's to me that's the different things that you do. Um, you don't really get to do stuff like that in academia until you're like on a National Academy report. But we do stuff like that pretty regularly and it feels good when you get done because it really does make a difference. I feel like the work that we do changes the world and I love that. Yeah, I mean, and even on that report, we have a bunch of faculty members at top universities, but like the national labs, I think we're good at orchestrating these big ambitious reports and projects. And so we tend to get to be like in the driver's seat uh, in the case of that report. And then you you pull in these awesome people to help you from, um, from national labs and academia. I'll, I'll offer from an NREL perspective, I think the differentiation is integration and scale up. We do a significant amount of work 
scaling up technologies, especially renewable energy technologies, and trying to understand how they integrate together. And so we have a we have a Flatirons campus that's just north of our main campus in Golden, Colorado, that has it's about a two to ten megawatt power scale where you're integrating uh, energy storage with a solar array with wind turbines and now you can connect a whole variety of technologies to that grid system that electric sort of 100 renewable grid system and that can be you know right now we have hydrogen electrolyzers up there at the one to two megawatt scale we have a toyota fuel cell that's going to do energy storage and convert help us convert the hydrogen back to energy uh, and then kind of uh, along those lines uh, as an example, I mean, I think to my knowledge, we had a we had a blackout at that site and we brought up the entire site on 100 percent renewable electricity, which to my knowledge has never been done for like a singular location to come up 100 percent of the black start off of 100 on 100 percent renewable energy. And so those are the types of like real world challenges you get to face. And what we can then do is simulate the entire we've done this. We've simulated the whole system issue that caused the power grid uh, blackout in Texas. And we've replicated that on our unit and understood what changes could have been made to not have that system crash. And so speaking to what Roger and, and Corinne said, right, the, the implications of those learnings are significant and it changes the way we operate sort of nationally and at the state level. And I think those takeaways, getting a chance to work on those, those types of problems is what's really cool about the labs. Uh, I'm so sorry to point out that we are at the top of the hour, which means our time is almost up. And we definitely did not get to all of the questions that that um, are on the Slido right now, but I think we had a very great discussion otherwise. Um, before we sign off, do any of you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? I've always loved working in a national lab, never regretted it. it yeah. you know, it's fun. It's you get you have a chance to make your career to be something that you really enjoy. Yeah, I feel like I hit the jackpot. Like this is really a really nice place to work. Um, you guys should feel free to look us up, reach out to us if you have more questions, and apply for postdoc positions. <laughs> find the find the PIs and email them. We need to hire you. <laughs> yeah, as Corinne said before, for kind of where we're at in our levels right there is the potential to leave and go to industry and get multiples of our salary and there's a reason we stay at the labs and that reason is because of the mission oriented save the world kind of big challenges that we work on in teams and it's a collective outcome it's not a oh my name is attached to this i have a group i have you know it's not the academic solely just that my name is what matters it's the, the problem being solved that matters That is such an inspirational note to to end on. Um, so I'm going to give you a round of applause. Thank you so much for your time today, for sharing your experience with us, and for telling us about National Labs, because we did not know all that much beforehand. Um, I will be sending out, oh, for everybody else, I will be uh, saving the recording, and I will send it out to you later. And um, would you all feel comfortable with me um, sharing your emails with the with the group? Oh yes, please do. Sure. Okay, then I will do that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, thank you so so much for everything today. Um, please reach out to to me or to us if if you ever want to know anything more. All right. Good luck, we'll to all. Appreciate it. Good luck, Thanks guys. for your time, everybody. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys.